Right. Fine. It's just a zoom. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I'll just formally welcome um, Helga Virick. We're incredibly pleased to be able to welcome to these series of, of radical anthropology seminars. Um, Helga really represents a kind of four field anthropology approach. I think that's fair enough to say um, mm -hmm. with a, both a cultural anthropology, evolutionary anthropology, archaeology and linguistics type of background. It's the sort of interdisciplinary approach that we've always tried to, um, to, to follow in radical anthropology group. Um, so we're really interested to, to hear what you have to say on this question of sex division of labor and your general experience and, and thoughts on the matter. Okay. So over, over to you and talk for as long as you feel no. like and we'll then have discussion. <laughs> yep. So I'll, I'll just introduce myself a little bit, a little bit more detail. I, uh, I, I did my doctoral um, program um, at the University of Toronto. Uh, I initially was going to go into archaeology. I did a summer dig um, at a place called Nasherini in Lebanon with a team put together by Br Bruce Schroeder. Um, and um, that, that research, uh, that dig, uh, was one of the last ones done there because, um, of course, uh, the, the Civil War and everything else that happened since then um, made it impossible to go back. And so Richard Lee, who was another one of my um, uh, instructors there, um, said, why not, uh, since I had funding and you know, grants and so on, why not, why not switch and, and do something in uh, ethnography of hunter-gatherers? Because I was already talking to a man called Hank Lewis, Henry Lewis, at the University of Alberta about fire ecology. Okay, and I was very interested in the role of ecological engineering among hunter-gatherers, particularly as, as it was, to my mind, an intensification of this, which eventually led to domestication of plants and animals. In any event, um, I was you know, thinking about going to Alberta <laughs> to do research, following up on what Hank Lewis had done. And then Richard Lee, stepped in and said, no, why not go to the Kalahari? I can, I can, uh, I can get you in there. And um, after a wonderful lunch with uh, Pat Draper and Henry Harpending, um, I got the use of a vehicle, uh, Richard set that up, and off I went. And I did in the end four, well, not quite four years in, in the Kalahari. Um, I did a drought survey towards the end of that time. However, I couldn't do fire ecology because the Botswana government had just uh, uh, um, initiated um, a, a law against all kinds of veldt burning and uh, people got fined and jailed and stuff if they set fire to the landscape. So I couldn't very well do interviews on that. And uh, it took me a long time to actually get the data on that you know, until things kind of calmed down. And so I had to switch and I, I wound up being really interested in the interface between hunter gatherers and the, um, the farming and pastoral people. And, and I wound up doing my PhD on that. And what I found out was very interesting to my mind. It was that the, the interface was really a zone of, um, uh, shall we say, uh, economic, experimentation on the part of the Bushmen. Okay, uh, I call them Bushmen because in the end, they told me they wanted to be called Basarwa. All this stuff about Hassan and Khoisan and everything is kind of politically correct, but they'd never even heard those terms. <laughs> so Basarwa just means Bushmen in Bantu, in the Bantu language. And in their own languages, they didn't have a term for themselves except the real people, okay? Uh, kwa, kwa Koi, in other words, their, their language name, which was Kwa, and then Koi, which means, you know, the, the real people. Um, I, I suspect every cultural group has a similar <laughs> feeling about themselves. <laughs> anyway, okay, so I was very lucky in that this group had long passed any kind of interest or fascination with the um, with the herding and farming culture and the, the you know the sort of uh, outside world that was brought to them uh, more recently, and they they were very conscious of the racism with which they were um, uh, faced, 
in these other cultures and rejected them. I so, still remember um, one of my closest, uh, I don't know, I would call it a friend or a, an, inter, a, 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 an informant, uh, Cloatre said one day, he said, if you ever see me with a chicken, I'm translating now, it's my chicken. I'm not looking after it for some, you know, the Kalahari guy, you know, <laughs> and that, that kind of illustrates to me the rejection of the role of serf or even employee. Okay, most of the people I knew had at some point or other been, uh, you know, closer to uh, working for um, as a herd boy or as a, an assistant in a in a agricultural operation doing bird scaring and harvesting or, you know, cooking or, you know, looking after kids in a camp or something like that. And they did this, it became very clear, they did this because uh, by filling in at times of labor shortages, they were very much more tolerated by the people who now controlled the main permanent water points. Okay. Okay, now there's another topic I'd like to get into, but I can't because there's no time. Um, and that is what, what happened to their hunting systems and their interaction with wildlife and so on as a result of the what they called the totally stupid uh, hunting practices of the Bantu dogs and and you know clubs and hunting on horseback and everything else but I'll get into that in another in another talk if I'm permitted um okay so the reason I am here today is because um uh, I think it was sometime last year, in the early part of the year, there was a report from South America about the excavation of a young person who turned out to be female, but who was buried with um, hunting paraphernalia, you know, okay? And there were a number of very excited reports about this. Uh, hang on, I'm, I'm just gonna call them up so I can, if they will. Oh yeah. Um, one of them, the, the main research article was um, uh, published in Science Advances, and that was last November 2020. And it was Female Hunters of the Early Americas, okay? Randall Haas, James Watson, etc. cetera, et al. Okay, and what, um, what, they, what they basically then did was they Question sexual division of labor among hunters and gatherers. They said, you know, this was kind of a, a standard empirical reality that most people had suggested based on ethnographic data. And it was then inferred to be the ancestral behavioral pattern. Okay, so then uh, they suggested that their discovery of this girl with the uh, hunting paraphernalia challenges the man the hunter hypothesis, okay? And of course, this was in the Andes, but, uh, and it was a burial of a, uh, that was about 9,000 years old and, uh, and so on. Most of you are familiar with this, okay? Uh, it was picked up all over the place uh, on inverse and uh, somebody called Sarah Wells actually wrote, uh, Actually, ancient big game hunters were women. <laughs> In prehistoric hunting, wasn't just a man's game, et cetera, et cetera, with you know predictable. And there was a um, an article which I can't remember which, where it appeared, but it was um, a, a picture of a young girl in a pink dress uh, throwing a spear at a a bunch of wild uh, vicuñas, I guess. Um, anyway, so. So anyway, um, this caused a great deal of excitement and it was picked up uh, here as well. And then uh, it was picked up on Twitter and everywhere else. And um, I, I was, <laughs> I was, I, I was almost amused by it. First of all, you know, in the, there is no man the hunter hypothesis that I'm aware of, okay? Um, that, title man the hunter was was the um the the title of the conference the man the hunter conference the original hunter gatherer conference and it was decided by werner gren who were the funders the book that's that subsequently followed edited by richard lee and uh, Irvin devore 
was also called that. And I think, you know, it was not only just for continuity, but it was because it was a kind of a catchy title and, and they didn't want to fight with Werner Grin about the funding, etc. So the thing is that it upset a lot of people who were feminist at that time. Uh, somebody even wrote a book called Woman the Gatherer. And this is very ironic because, you know, uh, most of you realize Richard Lee in that edited volume and at that conference was the one who pointed out that his research indicated that women were supplying, you know, 75 to 80% of all the calories. All right. Um, he even expressed dismay <laughs> that it was titled this way and that it got him under, it, it put him under attack. Okay, by people who felt, you know, that the role of women was being minimized, etc. But there is in our society, um, and has been throughout probably the history of civilization, a kind of a glorification of, of men as hunters. You see it on the, the, the tombs of the Egyptian pharaohs. There they are killing some poor leopard or, you know, eland or something with their chariots. Um, you see it today when, you know, the guy who runs that, what is it? Uh, I can't remember which big corporate guy this is, but he goes off to Africa and kills elephants, baby elephants, and stands over them like he's a great hunter. This is a, this is a meme, as it were, that has persisted, um, and it has infected a lot of people and the way that they view hunting as an activity. All right. Well, <clears throat> When I got to the field and I got a little bit better at the language, I always spoke basically children's language or baby talk, if you will, but because it's a really, really hard language to learn. It's got like, I don't know how many, uh, I think it was 39 uh, different sounds and there was clicks and toning and everything. I once asked a man if I could, you know, I got the tone wrong and left, asked a man if I could leave my camera equipment in his wife's vagina, if the hut word for hut and vagina is very, very, very close. And that's a kind of mistake. So I was a subject of considerable humor, I think. But anyway, so I started asking um, the women I knew. And the, the, the picture that was put up to announce this talk is very indicative because the, the two girls that I'm sitting with became my best friends, okay? They were the ones who jollied me off to go and do, to go and do a gathering with them. All right. And uh, I became more accepted, you know, as as a part of the scene because of them. And Malapai, the middle one, actually ran a trap line at one point. So that interested me. And I started to ask about whether or not she and, um, you know, some of the other girls I knew uh, aspired to be hunters and felt, um, you know, kind of pushed away from that by the men. And they laughed at me. They said, why would you want to be a hunter? You know, I mean, young men um, do aspire to be good hunters. That, that seemed pretty clear to me. So I, I said, well, why, why wouldn't you? And they said, well, for one thing, um, and I, I, don't, I, I suppose they've been told about this or perhaps some of them had tried it. In any event, for one thing, they said, you walk around all day, either with your, you know, instructor, you know, the person you're, you're apprenticed to, or um, by yourself, if you're supposed to be trying to hunt by yourself, which is the aim, I guess, uh, ultimately of becoming a good hunter. You walk around all day in silence. You can't talk to anybody. You can't even sing. You have to be careful even to sneeze in case you scare something. And, and uh, uh, you know, most of the time you come home empty, empty handed and it's hot and you're covered with thorn scrapes and mosquito bites and, you know, and you're miserable. You come home miserable because again, you didn't succeed. Like the hunting success ratio, uh, the average is one hunt in four is successful. Okay, what that means, so that's just the average. The success rate of men over 35, you know, was higher. It was sort of like, one in every third or second hunt. The success rate of the youngest men who were just learning was way lower. It was like one in seven hunts, okay? Now, can you imagine what that's like? You know, you go out and, and it's hot because they hunt during the day. That's another story that um, 
I'd like to explore, you know, when did this night hunting with dogs start? But anyway, um, you hunt during the day, you hunt as quietly as possible, you wander around for hours, you follow tracks, you try to get close enough to animals to hit them with a poison arrow, right? And at that point, you know the animal will <clears throat> continue going on, probably sort of itching and, and bruising at that spot until it feels the paralysis coming on and then it will seek someplace to go lie down. In the meantime, you hair back to camp and you get you know, all the men that you can to come with you to make sure get, it gets tracked properly. Because if you're a young hunter, your tracking skills are not that good, okay? It's very hard to learn to track um, properly in this kind of sandy environment. <clears throat> And you're going to need assistance in, uh, first of all, uh, uh, preventing other predators from zeroing in on this animal, okay, and also to, you know, butcher it and get it home, all right. So then, okay, so that was the goal. And if you manage that, uh, you were, it was clear that it was a group effort, okay. It wasn't some great hunter, you know being uh being the supplier of meat or anything it was a lucky hit in fact most of the time what i heard and i was able to tag on tag after these guys when they went after such an animal a couple of times was that you know um this was an animal that had sacrificed itself for the sake of the children in the camp this was an animal that had decided you know to help its brothers the humans and I remember one day, the first time I went out, one of the older men stopped when we came in sight of the animal, which was down, now it was down under a tree. And he sighed and he said, oh, oh, it's her. He knew this animal, he'd known it for years. He'd seen it have babies, you know, and on this occasion, this was the one that, that caught the arrow. You know, so that's the, that's the atmosphere. All right, so then I asked, you know, but you know, okay, so it's hard and it's, you can't talk very much, but you know, uh, and it doesn't give you very much kind of benefit at the end of the day. And the, the, what the girl said then, and she said, well, that's why we let the men do it. Because it's, you can't talk, you can't sing, you can't joke, you can't tell stories, you can't gossip while you're doing it like you can when you're gathering. I mean, I've been on those gathering trips. I mean, uh, the ones where they didn't want me to come were ones where I guess either they were talking about me or they, they were discussing very, you know, delicate matters of, you know, love and marriage or whatever and didn't, didn't you know, wanted privacy. But the times that I was able to go gathering with them, not that I gathered much, I mostly just carried my camera, but um it, it was just endless chatter jokes especially talking about the guys you know and gossip uh, that people have picked up and and just uh, little dances impromptu and singing and stuff like this and that it was a lively fun outing compared to you know the the way that hunting was described and the most important thing of all was that you always came home with plenty of food there were no like failed gathering trips, right? <laughs> You're not going to go out there and go, oh, I don't see any nuts in the trees. I don't know where the roots are. No, they knew this whole area, like the back of their, like a garden. In fact, they called it a garden. In fact, they had gardened it in the sense that, well, <clears throat> they, were manu they were making the landscape more productive with every trip, you know, for future for the future. When I was walking along the first few times, I was really puzzled to see women taking some nuts or some berries, you know, out of their pouches. We'd just been gathering these things, right? And I and I had to stop because they were healing the bunches of the ground and they did like three or four times on our way home. And I said, what are you doing? You know, and there, of course, you know, cause I always ask questions and I was hot and bothered. And they said, well, we have to give something back to the mother, right? But if you consider the consequences of just that, okay, aside from all the times that stuff sort of fell out of their 
fell out of their um, um, carosses every time they plunked them down to dig a root or something, okay? Because there were always stuff falling out. I used to be try, trying to be really helpful. I'd scoop stuff up and try to put it back in and they laughed at me and they said, <laughs> don't. Um, so all of this stuff, the whole you know, provisioning expedition of gathering, scattered seeds and berries and nuts, in other words, the babies of the mother, everywhere. And if you think this is, women do this maybe three times, maximum four a week, because they gather enough to last for two days for their household, okay? Um, the, the, the mathematics, I, I once tried to figure it out just for the, the group I was with, which was about a thousand people, uh, all in you know the whole language area and within uh you know within like a hundred years they would have planted like 10 million plants that's minimum assuming just six per trip okay but if each woman is doing this just do the math in your head this is major ecological engineering and most of it's done without even planning anything okay it's about gratitude it's about reciprocity at that point okay so <clears throat> the gathering activities, um, and this isn't even counting the sort of ecological hotspots that are created around every one of these temporary camping sites, because people spit stuff out, they, they throw things into the midden, uh, the withered little roots and stuff that don't get eaten, they go into the midden, the little kids are told, put that thing away in the midden before it dies, okay? So the, the, uh, the, the old camping sites were just immensely productive after probably after a 10 year period or so you could always count on finding edible roots and and berries and nuts and and certain kinds of uh, uh, um, plum trees and, and and so on growing there and we would actually um, uh, during the winter uh, during the dry season we would actually sometimes zigzag among old camping sites on our way back just to sort of fill up on on stuff easily because in the winter you know um there wasn't that much in the way of uh, fresh fruit and so having a lot of different groves that you could go to was really beneficial the other thing was root crops it was full of root crops because these things have been replanted okay so looked at in terms of the subsistence economy and division of labor of hunter gatherers, what women do gathering is not only um, more fun, always productive, and uh, you know relatively uh, relatively un shall we say unarduous really. I mean they carry a lot, but they're they don't seem to worry about the weight of it because the heavier guests, the closer they are to camp, right? And then they can rest for two days, do other stuff. In any event, the, what the women do is not only, you know, dependable and fun, but it's also ecologically completely critical to the hunter-gatherer relationship with their ecosystem, all right? And I think looking at it from a kind of, you know, a division of labor point of view, um, there another thing becomes clear, at least to me, and it was clear to them too, because it was a, it was a, who was it? It was Beitle or Beitle's son. I can't remember which one said it. I was doing hunting interviews because I did tons of these interviews on hunts, and and one of them just said, "Well, you realize, you know, that if um, if we didn't have the women." gathering we couldn't afford to waste all this time hunting they said that he didn't say waste he said to while away our time <laughs> translating badly but in other words this this you know obligation to bring meat into camp that was it was enough to actually depress young men when they were unsuccessful when they were young a lot of the trance dances that i saw were for treating people who were so depressed by their lack of hunting success that they'd fallen into a depression and they'd refused to get up and they were still lying in their, in their, on their, you know, carosses for days and days. And then the whole group would get together and they'd have a trance dance and a big celebration and, 
and 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 this person would be kind of jollied back into a, a state of hopefulness you know like we we're 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 going to cure your bad luck you're going to keep trying and so on hunting is hard right because it's the least um the least rewarding of the activities that hunter gatherers undertake that is my impression um and i know that this um this contradicts the view of many of the archaeologists who are excavating, uh, you know, sites 100,000, 300,000, no, three, well, yeah, long time ago, <laughs> of our hunter-gatherer past, because what they get is the lithic remains of the hunting toolkit, right? Um, and some of it has, I think, been mis misinterpreted as a hunting toolkit, because some of these scrapers and other uh, other things could just as easily be used to to process and dismember plants. But the thing is, hunting was not done as a, as a male activity that excluded females, all right? Men were perfectly um, uh, happy to come gathering. It's the women didn't want them because they wanted to gossip about the guys. Sorry, I, it sounds awful, but you know, it, it was not necessary for the men to come. Plus young men did not apprentice with their you know female relatives to learn where every type of plant grows to learn you know how to how to gather all these different things and 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 to learn that that part of the landscape they were more encouraged to learn animal behavior to understand um uh, aspects of you know how to make how to make arrows so they fl fly straight to target practice and especially to handle the poisons you know and so on they this division of labor i think functioned not because of you know male domination or anything but because it was practical and from an ecological standpoint uh what hunting did and i think this is really important what what hunters do when they're when they're out observing animals and trying to get you know close to them and so on is they keep very good track of of the uh status the health status um the reproductive uh activities of these animals um they know what can be harvested to what extent um they also keep pretty good track of all the kills made by lions and and other predators in the environment and and one of the things that this does i think is it um means that they hunt in a in a in a conscious way to not over harvest um certain species that are vulnerable um i once sat through like a like a three hour no it was longer than that debate or discussion or whatever it was <clears throat> that was occasioned by the fact that a man had actually killed a female eland and the, the you know instead of instead of um, letting the 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 eland calf come to come to life as it were and that was uh, that was a no no okay if you were going to hunt you tried to hunt selectively so you were hunting a healthy animal because you didn't want to pick up the diseases carried by sick animals, right? Um, you wanted an animal that was uh, sort of uh, in 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 you know good fitness because you wanted the fat that the animal carried, and and so you know you valued the activities of your fellow hunters, the lions, the leopards, the cheetahs. Why? Because those animals, and this has been shown now. Thank goodness. Um, by wildlife ecologists in, in Canada, they selectively prey on animals that are sick, okay? Prion diseases especially are very dangerous. As, as you probably know, they survive cooking because it's not actually an organism, right? It's a misformed, misaligned uh, uh, protein of some kind. And, and prion diseases, uh, you know, the danger exists worldwide. And it's only lately that we've come to realize how how bad they can be. In the United States right now, many of the wildlife services are recommending that people do not eat venison because there's such an epidemic of what's called chronic wasting disease among the deer. Well, what brought that on? 
it's they killed all the cougars, they killed all the wolves. So the disease is just rampant among these deer and it's spreading fast. Okay. The Bushmen knew. They told me, they said, these animals are our brothers. They keep us healthy because they keep the animals healthy. And I'm not the only person that's ever been told this. This was um, explained to, what was his name again? Farley Mowat, who did some book on uh, uh, people of the deer, on caribou hunters up north. And they told him too, that the wolves kept the deer healthy. The herds, you know, needed them. And this, this deep ecological understanding, this symbiosis that is going on here is really important, you know? And so I'm not saying that hunting as such um, is an unimportant part of the hunter-gatherer economy, but I think in terms of our understanding of how the whole hunter-gatherer um, uh, cultural ecology worked, how it evolved, that this, this was, both of them were critical, you know? Um, I, I, I tell this story sometimes. So if I have time, I'd like to repeat it. It's about giraffe. Is that okay? You familiar with this one? Okay. Well, as you know, um, um, Lorna Marshall's son made a film uh, called The Hunters, and it and it follows some um, some people up in Ngami Land, you know, where where much of the fieldwork has been done among a, a language group different from the one I was with, about eight hundred, almost a thousand miles to the north uh, west. Anyway, he follows. A giraffe hunt, okay, and so they they hit the giraffe, and of course poison arrows. <laughs> giraffes, are, anyway, so it's a long, long hunt, and in the end, you know, they kill this giraffe with spears. Actually, they pulled it down with a truck, but that or shot it with a. But anyway, never mind. So I had seen this film, and I was very impressed, you know. And so when I came to the Kalahari, there were plenty of giraffe. I mean, not plenty, plenty, but I certainly saw giraffe quite frequently in the area where I was doing field work. But you know what? Nobody was hunting them. No, none of the none of the Kwa were hunting them. And so after a while, during, you know, after X number of you know, hundred hunting interviews, I asked about this. And I was told, oh well, it's it's for a very good reason. And some of them were a little hazy about this. I was told to go speak to somebody. This lady who lived, you know, like about a hundred miles to the to the east of where I was doing these interviews. So I eventually got out to see her and she was this little little granny, right? She's sitting there in a camp. Uh, the other women have gone gathering, a couple of old men are sleeping under the uh, lean-tos and she's kind of uh, got the kids around her. And so I, I went ahead I, I, and, and explained what I was interested in. I wanted to ask her about giraffe. She brightened right up. She was so pleased, you know. I think most people in her society probably really tired of hearing her talk about giraffe because she's one of these obsessed people, you know, from childhood. She wanted to know everything about giraffes. She, anyway, so I asked the question, I said, why shouldn't the giraffe be hunted? I've noticed that the young men here don't hunt the giraffe. And she said, oh, ah, it's the, it's the midwife of the acacia. Okay. So I go, oh, okay, and I write this down, you know, I'm thinking, and, and then, you know, I asked her more questions and it gradually came out, you know, she had noticed <clears throat> that um, acacia seeds would pass through the giraffe, be deposited at quite distant, quite distant, and then sprout. And in fact, that's, that seemed to be the main thing that was spreading uh, these acacias. They're, by the way, they're not scientifically labeled as acacias anymore, but you know what I mean. These big, you know, sort of um, fan-shaped uh, giant trees that you see in the in the Central African savanna regions. Okay, so, and then she told me, she said, God made the giraffe tall enough to take the babies of the acacia, in other words, the seed pods, and spread them. Okay, that's why we say it's a midwife. It was only years later that I learned that the acacia is a legume. It uh, fixes nitrogen in its roots with a symbiosis with the bacteria, right? And it is because of the spread of the acacia that the Kalahari remains as green as it does. In other words, you know, spreading nitrogen. This is a very, very sandy 
uh, soil type and uh, not 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 really rich in nutrients but having these trees that are basically giant you know like uh, legumes um, really opens up the environment to uh, to other species of, of plants and 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 that of course leads to more animal diversity as well there's another thing there um, the um, the so-called uh, um, um, marama nut, which is also a uh, legume, okay. And by the way, marama nuts were what these women were often dropping on their on their gathering trips. So you know, just think of the observational and knowledge that that sort of sums up. Like she didn't know how to explain why the acacia was the um, essential plant in the Kalahari and that the, the animal that spreads this plant is vital, vitally important, okay? But she knew. And I think that sums up like hundreds of years, thousands of years of observation and discussion and, uh, you know, what we call wisdom, if you will. It's the first science of mankind is ecological engineering. And I won't even get into fire ecology unless there's time. Okay, does that, uh, does that open up if I talk long enough? I can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, no, I, I just uh, unmute. Um, yeah, well, that sets things up. I mean, perhaps if people ask questions, you can come up and respond mm -hmm. and that, that, that will get things going. Um, that, that was already a really great um, picture. I think it's, uh, that's fantastic with the giraffes there. Um, do, does anybody have burning questions to ask at this point? Chris? I have oh. a few. But... Chris, Chris, yeah. go. Well, it's just that I, f I first knew of your work when I heard the, uh, the story, um, uh, the trickster story about God's testicles. And you were oh. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and you were mentioning how 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 the women when they're gathering they laugh a lot, and I just wondered if you could tell us that story and um, you know anything else around that whole topic because of course the issue of whether hunter gatherers are um, sort of cowering in, in the face of kings in the form of their gods, or whether they actually their div divinities are <laughs> are tricksters has, has been quite a controversial topic uh, recently. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh well, that. <clears throat> it's actually an important question. I appreciate it because um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. Um, they had when I when I was able to uh, get that depth of, of um, interview going. <clears throat> they had a concept of a single creator, okay, uh, kind of a, an, a spiritual um, creator of the entire universe who sort of animated everything. Um, they said the two things that came from the immaterial, the spiritual, the, uh, the unknown side of reality were fire and love, okay? And love was not just love, love, right? It was, it was the animate, it was life, okay? It was what made things alive, all right? And so, you know, I, I, I finally got the name. I can't even remember what it is now. And, it, and it's unimportant because they told me it, it, we don't know the real name of the creator because how can we know it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's immaterial. So then my next question, because I had my copy of, you know, notes and records with me, uh, was what would be the, um, uh, you know, is, is your God male or female? couldn't believe such a stupid question <laughs> they said you know what uh well if it manifests on earth you know when uh, uh, quite often um if it's human or or any other species of animal then it's going to come out as male or female but that's just what happens in a material form an immaterial being does not need genitalia they don't pee, they don't screw, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't have sex. What are you thinking? And I realized how stupid that question was, you know? Okay, so, so there's that. Now, here's the thing. There are a lot of 
sort of stories that I was told were sacred, okay? And one of them was the story of the bees chasing testicles. Now that, with that, you know, introduction to it, I had to ask uh, that it be told to me, of course. And the story goes that um, God, this immaterial creator being, was looking down and on, you know, the world, and he was following for some reason, maybe they mentioned his name, I don't know, or her name, who knows, um, uh, following a group of gathering women. And he was particularly entranced by one young woman um, in the group and uh, basically wanted to, wanted to get closer to her. Um, and as a result, he, he, he popped into material existence as a small human. Now, I don't know if this was like a homunculus, like a, giant, a miniature man, or whether it's supposed to have been a child. They didn't describe it. In any event, this little being popped into existence and he was following these women as they were gathering. And everything that he saw them gathering, you know, if they stopped at nut, a nut grove and got a bunch of nuts, he would follow and eat a bunch of nuts as well. And as he was eating everything that they were gathering, as he saw them gathering, he was growing into, you know, full human size. Okay. <clears throat> At one point, he was already quite big, probably the size of a 10-year-old kid or something. And uh, the, the woman he really liked, the young woman he really liked, um, dropped her cross to, uh, to dig out a root. Everybody else was doing it. So what he did is he snuck inside it because he was getting really tired. That was what was said anyway. And, um, and when she was finished, she picked up the cross. It was a little heavier, but you know she didn't mind. And so while she was and then they all decided to go home and so when she when she um oh that's the other thing she dropped in on top of the cross this great big heavy root that she dug up and it knocked him out okay so he came to about halfway back and he's been he's walk he's been aware of the fact that he's being carried along and um and he's very hungry again. So he eats almost everything that's in the cross. And uh, she gets home. And by this time, he's quite big and she's very tired. And so she, she takes the big root out and she sets it to cook and uh, doesn't, doesn't notice him, okay? And so he creeps out of her cross, still eating everything that's left in it, except for the root. And, uh, and, and sort of hides behind the, behind the, I don't know whether it was at the back of the hut or behind the hut. I'd have to check my notes what, how, the, how that was worded. But anyway, meanwhile, she goes next door to, the, to a hut, like, you know, tw 30, 20 feet away and says, oh, by the way, I did get that really nice marama root and I'm cooking it right now. Can I bring it over and we can share it? Because I guess this was with her mother's or her sister's um, household or something that, that, that she had next door. And, and so they said, oh, sure, okay. And then she, in the meantime, because she had taken it out of the fire to cool before she went to give this generous uh, offer, um, the guy had found it, God had found it and eaten it. It was gone. So she gets there and she looks around where where is it and she goes she goes around to the to all the households there were like four other households in that camp and accuses everybody of stealing it you know and they all say no oh, we wouldn't do a thing like that we've got plenty of food you know you're crazy kind of thing she says well what happened to it oh and they are all mad at her and everything so she goes back to her hut and she's really she doesn't even want to bother eating now. And then she lifts her cross to see if there's some berries. There's nothing left in it. They've stolen everything. So now she's really pissed off. And she decides, I'm just going to go to sleep. So she gets into bed. It's evening now. The fire's dying down. Everybody's quieting. And goes to sleep. And at this moment, God, now the size of a full-grown you know, human male, I guess, uh, creeps around and 
gets under her blankets with her. It's, oh, you were so beautiful. You were so beautiful. And she says, who are you? Right? You're not. And she gave me some name. It was the name of her, I don't know, it was her young husband or her fiance or something. The man that she was going to be marrying soon. That's why she had a separate hut. <clears throat> who are you? And he, you know, he didn't care. He just wanted to get his way with her. He was going to rape her essentially. Um, and so, no, oh, she wasn't having any of this. You know, she pulled out her knife because they all have knives and stuff, right? For cutting roots, <laughs> among other things. And she just cut off his testicles, just like that. And he went, ah, popped right out of existence. I'm, t I'm, I'm telling you the way the story was told to me with all the sound effects. Anyway, so then, so then the balls in their little sack were left behind, right? She looked around, she said, where'd this guy go, right? And she saw these little balls hopping along, right? <laughs> and so she called upon her friends, the bees. And I said, well, wait a minute, people don't talk to bees. And they looked at me, the, you know, the storyteller looked at me and says, this is a myth. <laughs> in other words it's a story you know get with it so okay so she calls the bees to sting the testicles okay now what you have to picture here the bees are stinging right the little sacks are popping up and down every time they're stung and they're trying to get away and you have to picture something like a sack race now okay i mean that's how it was described to me and and she saw them disappear over you know the next little uh, sand dune and um and thought, good riddance, you know, what was that? And, and she couldn't figure out what had happened. And so she, again, went to all the other huts and accused everybody, all the men there, of having tried to rape her. Okay. Now, this was just too much. And now everybody was really mad at her. And they were all telling her off. And so by this point, she said, all right, I'll prove it. And so she went out and she looked for these balls. Okay. She tracked them. It wasn't hard, you know, a little sack. Anyway, she finally found they, they had buried themselves in the sand to get away from the bees, all right? So she pulled them out. And in the meantime, I guess they died or something. I don't know. Anyway, she, she went and showed them to people and said, see, here, here are his testicles. And everybody handled them and looked at them and sniffed them. And they said, yeah, they, they do smell. Hmm, they might be good to eat, <laughs> right? And so they cooked them and ate them and they were delicious. They were the first Kalahari truffles. <laughs> the origin of the Kalahari truffle, one of the most expensive uh, of all truffle varieties. Just look it up, okay? I, I just about <laughs> fell over backwards when he hit that punchline in the story. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it, you know? <laughs> But that's the story. Okay, so now here you have to remember this story was told on one of the times at, at one of the times that I had a bunch of families invited for dinner at my camp. Okay, and it was told in front of a whole range of children. It wasn't just an adult story. Okay, and the the children were <laughs> reacting to it. Some of them may have heard it before, but I, I started thinking about later. I thought, you know, what are these children learning? Well, for one thing, they're learning that, you know, once you incorporate as a material being, even if you're, you know, the creator of the universe, you can really screw up. <laughs> you know, you can really do, you know, silly things and, and, and have crazy ideas and all this. That's the sort of trickster model, right? Um, but as a result of your mistake, good things can happen. Like every, every little hole that oozed sperm, right, from, from those balls as the bees were stinging them and they were trying to get away, gave rise to the Kalahari truffles. It spread them all over the place, you know. So there was that. And then the, the other thing that was really, really clear to me is that the, 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 the girls were learning that you share food, that's good. You don't accuse people of not sharing <laughs> or stealing or trying to rape you because people in that society take that very seriously. And it's usually a wrong accusation, at least in that society. Is it's, you know, it's not, not the right way to deal with each other as, you know, for men to deal with women and vice versa. So God didn't even know how to, the first thing 
about falling in love or wanting sex. God was so ignorant, he completely screwed up and got his balls chopped off. Okay. So the children were learning that and they, they were also learning that you don't rape women or they'll chop off your balls. <laughs> you know, um, you don't, even God can't do that. Okay. Now this is a very, very different message from the story of little Virgin Mary who gets knocked up by God and then is uh, informed by his lieutenant, you know, some angel he sends down to tell her to go ahead, you know, she's going to have this baby and it's going to save the world and everything be fine. You know, excuse me, but I, as far as I'm concerned, Virgin Mary should have just done what this little story in, told, you know, and then we wouldn't be, oh, I don't know, the, the idea of, of God the Father impregnating a, a teenager without her knowledge and then getting her to go along with it, marry some other guy so that the, you know, and that all of this is so sick compared to the story I just told. I'm sorry. Yep. But, you know, it's, it's such a different view of the, of the autonomy and, and rights of both young people, of both men and women to interact as individuals yep. and not on the basis of, of domination and, and, and subjugation, you know? So to me, that story says a lot about that kind of culture, you know? Um, and the hunting interviews, frankly, uh, uh, with, the, with the girls and the, and, and the boys, um, the men and the women in older age groups uh, also taught me that, that it's not a matter of, um, of, domination the, the choices that people make in that environment are practical and logical and ecologically sound and that was what i learned you know division of labor is is a way of um expressing it that doesn't even come close to the original form that it took you know if if you think for instance of um collecting clams along a seashore. This is something women could do with predictable results. They could also manage clam beds and things like that, or oyster beds, I don't know which, which one they, they would be, or, or other kinds of shellfish. Um, there would be other kinds of activities where women uh, could participate, for instance, um, in blind hunting, where you're driving animals towards a, a hidden location. And this is the technique uh, most often used with migratory animals that are moving in big herds. Uh, the women participate quite happily in driving, in driving the animals towards a few concealed hunters, you know. Um, but it's not a division of labor based on an idea of one sex being superior, okay? And I think that's really important. Does that satisfy you, Chris? Oh, more than satisfied. It's the, it's the, <laughs> it's the best, best telling of a story and, and probably the best story um, I've heard in a long time. Thank you so much. It's absolutely marvelous. Oh, you're welcome. It's an incredible story. Mm -hmm. Helga, can you say more about uh, the young hunters and um, issues like bride service? Are young men coming into um, the girls' camp and then kind of learning to hunt with that camp or yeah or to some extent yeah. well the, let's put it this way bride service it, it's made it makes it seem like such an institutionalization right but in fact what i saw was um that the um the people who had the most interconnections who had a lot of um social networks and so on um both male and female marriage into their kind of circle was very desired okay yeah. and um some of them were had all these interconnections because they were you know very reliable hunters okay mm -hmm. um you know as you get older a man of you know 60 70 who's who's got a hunting kill rate of like one every second hunt uh that that's going to be a camp you know where you're going to learn a lot it's going to be a camp where there's going to be a lot of a lot more regular meat supply kids are going to be healthier and it's going to be a bigger camp because everybody wants to learn from him and live live there right so you get these these kind of 
uh, network hubs, and they're not all men, you know, uh, by any means. But 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 in a case like that, um, the daughters of such a person uh -huh. will be magnets yeah. of young yeah. men who want who want to be in, involved in that, and all their parents too, because uh, you know the the thing is that that if you have a, a charismatic, diligent, generous, diplomatic, um, courageous person who's who's really learned how to hunt well. Okay, and the same is true of anybody who's really learned how to how to heal well, or somebody who's a tremendous um, creator of new music, by the way. But anyway, in the case of a hunter, you know, his daughters will attract suitors in part because they want to be in his camp. Okay. And um, Malapai, the young lady in the middle of that picture that you posted, um, she actually got married before I left to a young man called Setle, who was from the, he was from a, a group of uh, camps near the borehole. And he, you know, given, you know, the paucity of game and all the, the, the problems of trying to hunt near the borehole, he had never learned to hunt and he idealized it. You know, the life of the hunter-gatherer. Also, also he's sick to death of the racism from you know the the Bantu-speaking people there, and and he 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 focused on her. They fell in love. They got married, and here he was in camp. Okay, mm -hmm. and she was really disappointed because she really liked the fact that he had access to the borehole and all the radio music and the and the goomba goomba dancing and everything and she thought by marrying him she would have more access to all this exciting outside world well whereas he just wanted to get away from it but anyway so there's there's that mm. but one of the main reasons he was there was because he wanted to learn from her father okay yeah. her father being the fellow who said that about the chicken right uh -huh. I ever have a chicken okay so hunting being an expert hunter was to some extent a statement of ethnic um, identity okay just as being a knowledgeable gatherer was a statement of ethnic identity and the wild foods and I've written a little paper on this somewhere in the past um, it it hardens as it were the differences between ethnic groups when you get an ethnic boundary emerging like that and mm -hmm. so um this marriage that i saw was part of that phenomena now of course in other places um i saw marriages take place and almost invariably um the young couple would reside with that girl's parents okay mm -hmm. now i don't know if you want to call this bride service or not most of it was due to the fact that um, young women, uh, what they told me was they wanted to be near their mothers um, during the early years because when they had babies, they they needed the support. And I'll tell you, I mean, I did extensive genealogies in every camp I was ever in, and what I found was it was just as frequent uh, under the such circumstances to have the young man's parents living in the same camp. For a while anyways after the marriage mm -hmm. and and even grandparents and friends of both sides mm -hmm. and people would be coming and going and the camp would disperse and it would regroup in other ways but what would tend to stay together for the first few years was that girl and her mother yeah. okay and the husbands they were attached to yeah. so i don't know if you want to call the husband that the young woman was attached to as performing bride service mm -hmm. i i i I know that's how it was described in the literature and the idea being that what he was now hunting with her father for the household and their households for a long time were, were somewhat contiguous, you know, um, but he wasn't doing any service. He was, he, he was married to her now. He was part of their household. And gradually as, as he learned to hunt better, if, if like in the case of Tetla, he really needed to learn to hunt. Um, uh, that household began to think, you know, the young household began to see itself as potentially, um, what's the word that's sometimes used, neolocal. In other words, to just go and visit friends somewhere, mm -hmm. to go stay with, you know, some uncle that, that neither of them had seen, you know, for a long time, or, or just to, you know, go visit other people 
and spend, you know, four or six weeks living in their camping, camping party. Okay. But, but by that time they would have had like one or two little children. Um, They'd want to show these children to various relatives. And quite often they would, they would move the furthest. In other words, they had distant friends and relatives. Um, In the case of um, um, uh, Tsetla, this young man, he, he was only sort of a quarter um, qua, okay? His okay. mother had been a concubine of a Bakalahari man in that, in that uh, settlement. Okay. Uh, so, you know, he grew up basically as a, um, as a sort of um, mixed blood, but looked down on by everybody because he was, just, he was, he was not the same, okay? Yeah. And that's part of the reason, the racism. That's one of the reasons he wanted to leave. But his mother's, I can't remember if it's his mother's father or his mother's mother, but had been Tuikwe, okay? And they had periodically visited that, that borehole to visit that, that young woman living there. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so he, he missed, you know, he wanted to pr- present their, his young children and his u- new wife to them. And just before I left, the two of them with their little child, um, plus his her parents came along too were headed for a place called tamo which is in the very southern edge of the central kalahari game reserve okay um it's a Tuikwe community okay and that's when i actually began to realize that a lot of these language groups you know they're not um uh, unilingual like they speak they all spoke each other's language to some extent. They had friendships and to some extent, a certain amount of intermarriage. My estimates were about 2% per generation of all marriages were between different language groups, okay? Um, So this meant that the networks spread Mm -hmm. all across the Kalahari from this one little group Mm -hmm. into, you know, regions hundreds of miles away. And it meant too that they could um, in a sense, visit these other areas. There wasn't this an uh, agonistic uh, um, boundary. It wasn't us them or anything like that. All they had to do was was show up with the um, name who they were and who their who their relatives were. And somebody would say, "Oh, I know him. He's about he's yeah. camped uh, you know a day a day away from here. Your friend? Yeah, I remember that." And, and you'd be taken on trust. That's how the networking works, you know? And the, the annual assemblages where, where these different language groups uh, get together are mm-hmm. times when these felt children form these friendships mm-hmm. and they last a lifetime, you know? And even if you only get to visit your friend from childhood, maybe three or four times every, every decade, it still counts. Mm-hmm. We do it too. Yeah. What do you think, you know, our yeah. visiting and everything else, uh, visiting relatives, we visit friends. What do you think our conferences are? <laughs> our academic conferences. Those are all part of the same kind of networking system. Yeah. But anyway, somebody else had a question, I think. Um, yeah. Or left, I don't um, know. Chris has got his hand up, but is anybody else want a question? Um, then, Chris, did you want another question? Well, it's just on bride service. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, um, Helga. I think some, some of us in RAG, although we know that all these concepts are completely useless and inappropriate, some of us actually quite like bride service as opposed to the idea of weddings and marriage, because it's important to stress that you don't have a wedding and, there, and thereafter the man has conjugal rights in his wife, it, like she can't say no from that point onwards. So I just perhaps, would you just say a little bit about you know, because even even the word wife and husband or weddings or marriages and stuff, are, obviously all these are comp- pretty much as useless as the other concepts you've been discussing. But could you just say a bit about what constitutes a wedding and what constitutes marriage and what kind of rights or a man does have or doesn't have uh, in the in the person that we over here are calling his wife? <clears throat> well, it's not a real wedding. It's a it's a it's a coming together. She builds her own hut. Okay. She has already been in a relationship with this young man. They're clearly in love, okay? The parents approve, his parents approve. They all come together in the same camp and they, they see this young couple enter their own hut, <laughs> you know? And then 
usually the 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 mother is really really pleased because this means that this girl is going to get really serious about gathering and not lie around sleeping all day or visiting her pals in the next camping site um for the young man it's a point where he has to get really serious about becoming one of the men and learning to hunt properly you know it's the initiation uh, it's like a you know you're an adult now kind of thing you can you got to try to be an adult now um in a sense um i think when when uh, hunter gatherers were first uh, studied, mm -hmm. you know, when the first ethnography was done. Um, as as Chris just pointed out, terminology was applied that um, formalized what we saw, right? But I think the the main purpose of a wedding, uh, a formalized marriage, in uh, subsequent societies has to do with the rights um, to claim that any uh, children that are born for your own lineage. And hunter-gatherers don't have lineages by and large. I mean, I know the Northwest Coast ones seem to have a kind of incipient system and so on, but they're not tribal, okay? In the sense of having, you know, lineages and sort of senior headmen and, and, and people who can be um, in charge of things uh, and who have to somehow assemble task forces from, you know, the, the young people within the lineage to get things done. That kind of becomes a necessary form of social organization um, when you have much, much more work that has to be done in groups. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, Forming a temporary task force for a, 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 a to drive game or something or to undertake a group hunt that doesn't necessarily produce a permanent leader. Okay, it's mm -hmm. just the best person for the job. I mean, I know that the best tracker always took over the tracking. It was understood, and everybody else was closely watching what he was doing. Okay, and uh, you know there were all kinds of people who were acknowledged to be the authorities, the people who knew the most about something, like this lady who knew all about giraffes, okay? And, and people defer to it because most people are not that interested in giraffes or, you know, these, the minutia of how to get an arrow straight. There was a guy that everybody really liked to get digging sticks from because he had the technique down really, really well about how long to leave it in the coals to make it hard and then to sharpen it really well. And he, he selected the best wood and on and on, you know, and, and uh, everybody could sort of make a digging stick, but digging sticks from him, you know, if you could get one from him as a, as a gift, that was a big deal. Okay. So, you know, and people would actually go to, to watch him make, make, his tools because he was the expert mm. I, uh, one of the things that really bothers me about recent um writings on you know the transition to farming and all the rest of it is that the idea is that individualism and specialization emerged after yeah you know it didn't mm. it didn't i, I mean hunter gatherers even have hobbies there are people who like watching birds and they've, you know, they've looked at the minuta of all the differences and they worry about their, you know, <laughs> it, it, this is human. This isn't, this isn't something, you know, individualism isn't something that emerged when we became members of state societies yeah. or agricultural communities or anything like that. So yeah. anyway, yeah. did somebody, yeah. somebody speaking? Sorry. We've got Jerome here. We've got a lot of people here who need to. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and Bruce Parry. Any, any other questions? Is that Denise uh, Arnold? Denise Arnold. It is Denise Arnold, yes. And J Jerome, you want to say something? And then Jerome, William. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much for that, Helga. Lovely to uh, see you again after a few years. Yeah, it's been and, uh, since Vienna, right? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, and that was really so nice to uh, get your sort of explanation of the, 
well, what's often called para cultivation, this uh, gentle encouragement of the wild resources of a landscape and how human beings enhance these resources, not just for themselves, but of course, every other animal that, that mm -hmm. uh, enjoys those resources too. And, uh, and, and I just, yeah, have you published anything on that? Well, on I'm that? trying to, in fact, I sent, I sent something to um, uh, the journal, uh, what's it called now? It used to be Before Farming. I'm and I don't have word back, yeah. Um, oh. I sent something to the that journal of uh, human evolution and ecology, and I got turned down. I don't know. I could I could send it around to you guys if anybody wants to 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 critic it and give some comments. Send, you know, send it to me because I'm surprised we haven't received that at Hunter Gatherer Research. I'm one of the co-editors, okay. so please okay. do send it. I'd be very interested in publishing that. So I think yeah. it's very important. Well, there, yeah, I think so too, and I think part of the Thing is maybe I'm too um, I'm, I'm not academic enough in the way I describe it <laughs> it's, I, I just I'm, I'm so tired of these dry abstracts and everything else you know I'm not I'm not really good at that but you know the other thing I think is that in the intervening years since Vienna I have actually um, been you know where I presented all that stuff on networking and and um, dependency ratios and so on, which I didn't even talk about here now. But um, since then, uh, so much more material has come out on the use of fire ecology, the use of um, replanting, you know, uh, the whole discovery that the Amazon forest is uh, basically a, a man-made food forest, you know, and I think that started long before people had were using slash and burn there, you know. Um, the fact that uh, Australian hunter-gatherers had actually managed wildfires there for centuries, for thousands and thousands of years, in a way that prevented massive uh, forest loss and die-off. You know, uh, the fact that the very similar information on on ecological engineering exists worldwide: California, northern Alberta. Um, along the east coast and so on and it's not just engineering using fire ecology it's management of hydrology you know the the to keep the the wild fish populations up it's um, management of uh, other species like wolves you know why you know what I touched on before why not eat wolves and 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 lions in in the Kalahari because they keep us healthy they keep the game healthy you know, that awareness is still not penetrating. I saw a kind of a horrifying, um, to me, report on the Hadza recently. It was on YouTube. It was something about wild and free. I can send you the link. And this guy is interviewing these young Hadza guys on what's important and how they hunt. And I, I, I found out from that that they were hunting at night with dogs and spears. And they were hunting baboons baboons the bushmen would be horrified by that they said those that's like eating people you know and actually i mean that may be the way that they present it. baboons as as relatives yeah 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 and the thing is that that must be new but but anyway i mean it's um it's uh, it's it's like a taboo um that that probably kept people healthy because the diseases carried by wild primates are much more easily transmittable yeah. to humans. And you really don't wanna kill those animals and touch them and get close to them. Like look at Ebola, where did that come from? You know, I mean, so the, the fact that they're hunting baboons, that they're uh, killing and eating anything, that they're no longer hunting with bows and arrows much, you know, like nothing, nothing subtle you know, nothing involving that, distance hunting. That, that, would be that quite, really worried me. That, that would be quite recent that yeah, only the yeah. years of dogs because they yeah. were certainly hunting poisoned arrows within I know. 10 years ago. I know, that, I know. That I, mean, I, was, I was really horrified. Anyway, the thing is that that pattern that I saw, and there's a little YouTube video on it, a couple of them that he did actually and presented there, um, the pattern of hunting with dogs and spears at night right that was emerging in places very close to the bantu settlements and that's because the game had a very big flight distance there and they had to kill anything they could you know most of the really good game was gone okay 
the animals had far too much um, fear of humans to be approached uh, to get them with a poison arrow and hunt them quietly. Um, in fact, you couldn't get them to, to you couldn't approach them at night at, at, in daytime at all because the flight distance was so huge. And the, the only quaw that I spoke to who had this problem and were starting to hunt with dogs and spears were the ones right near the Bantu settlements who had, you know, like the, um, the people in the Katlang district and some of the people down uh, in the Western Quinang who were in areas long settled by um, Bakalahadi. And, and they, they had kind of given up with their proper hunting methods because the animal's behavior had changed. You know, it takes, the estimate now is between seven and 12 generations in a population of wild animals is required to eliminate the fear of a certain predator, you know? And the best estimation, the best, the best illustration that I can give you of how that works is what happens in national parks. You've all been to a national park, right? A place where, you know, wild animals are still living. And what happens there, I, I, I don't know, if Algonquin Park, Banff, Yellowstone, is that the visitors come and the animals just walk right by them. In fact, they come up for potato chips, okay? And that becomes a danger. You know, the bison are no longer afraid of people. The elk are, are you know, wapiti are sleeping all over the golf course and people can't play their games. <laughs> you know, I've been to these places, Jasper and Banff, it's a real problem, okay? That means the animals, animals have a culture and within that culture, they pass on to each new generation what, what critters you have to be afraid of, what things you must be afraid of. And if they go for many, many generations without any attacks by humans, humans are fine. Humans are fine. Don't worry about the humans. In fact, they'll give you food. That's what, what's told to these young, young animals. You know? And I think our original hunting and gathering system um, was developed, including the fire ecology and all the replanting and everything else, at a time when most game populations were extremely endangered. You know, there was a there were mega droughts in Central Africa. They you know four or five times that were so severe that um, like Lake Malawi was evaporated. Like it was like a a, a muddy little muddy little death canyon or something, you know, it was almost gone. That's how bad these droughts were. Can you imagine what the fires were like? Mm -hmm. They had to defend them. They, the people had to develop um, ways of preventing these wildfires from overcoming them in whatever refuge areas they had were able to retreat to where there was still a, an ecosystem to, to support them. And of course, they didn't just go there by themselves all of the game animals and the types of plants that were critical to their survival, those, those were right there in these refuge areas with them. And at that point, if you start, you know, uh, going after, uh, going after a, a herd of gazelle or dikers or elephants or anything else with a spear with a bunch of guys, right? Those animals are going to disappear. You know, you can't, you can't, um, hunt animals in a small contained area with great frequency, loudly and obviously, because you know anybody who survives that, that particular hunting experience is, is going to be really frightened every time they see humans after that, right? Um, and predator fear, we now know, uh, there's data, there's quite good data on this, uh, can actually interfere with the reproductive abilities of animals. Animals will abandon their young. Uh, birds will just not even have nests. They'll just, you know, drop eggs everywhere. They won't even, they won't even feed their young if they have any. And um, pregnancies will end in abortions in wild game animals much more frequently, where there's enormous fear of hunting. Okay, so um, the 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 keystone role of the human as a as a hunter in the African environment, right, was probably good in the same sense that the keystone wool role of wolves in Yellowstone, you know, which has now been well documented, 
restoring them to Yellowstone caused a change in behavior of the animals. They didn't overgraze, you know, uh, fear of the hunter meant that they moved differently and the whole ecosystem in a sense revived because um, you know, the areas near rivers and lakes were no longer overgrazed and so on. Well, I'm sure that humans worked in very similar, in a very similar way. They were added to a suite of predators, okay? But in addition to that, they weren't just hunters, as I've just explained. Most of what they did was, was enriching and diversifying the ecosystem. They created hotspots of plant growth. And a lot of the, the, the material that they were doing, and this is probably through for millions of years, was beneficial, okay? And that's, I think, one of the reasons why, um, you know, humanity evolved as a successful species. It wasn't just the man, the hunter role, okay? It wasn't just the keystone hunter role. It was the ecological engineering role. And at the point where we had these mega droughts in, in Africa, in Central Africa, and people were confined to small refuge areas with the whole viable ecosystem that they were dependent on, they had to learn to look after that ecosystem and the animals within it. And one of the things they learned was to reduce predator fear if they could. And you only do that by not appearing to be hunting them. Okay, and so you learn to hunt very, very quietly, little bows and arrows, something which uh, the rest of the herd won't even remember. And, and, you know, that way you reduce predator fear, you reduce stress, um, sometimes um, by using fire ecology, you prevent wildfires. So everything they were doing was conserving and preserving those ecosystems. And until we understand this as a culture, you know, Western civilization as a culture, we will not stop doing the opposite, logging, overfishing, you know, destroying uh, wildlife everywhere we find it, all the poisons that we spread out. It, it, if we're gonna save humanity, the hunter-gatherers are the key. Yes. Thank you. I, I have one question, Helga, but I'll leave that because I see other people have got questions and I'll come back to it later. Okay. But thank you very much. So, uh, William and then Denise, and then we'll come back to Jerome. Okay. William? Yes? Hi, yes. Um, I had a, a, is there any information on um, two spirits there, where, like whether men would, would stay with the women and women would go with the men? Uh, you mean, uh, uh, homosexuality and transsexuality well yeah that's that's yeah. if you want to sure. reduce two spirit to that yeah yeah sure um uh in fact um such people were treasured i'll tell you why um here's a case i mean i actually observed this there's these two men who formed a household together i assumed you know i mean nobody ever said anything and i I was sort of, you know, I didn't want to give offense or appear too inquisitive. So I've never came out, of, you know, I mean, under the same cross. Anyway, they were older guys and everybody adored having them in their camp. Why? Because they were both decent hunters. They were good storytellers. The one was a bit of a, you know, he could do some good healing as well. But they, the, they were really decent hunters. They were older. They'd had experience. They, they dropped these, the um, um, ratio of no-show hunts to, to, to successful hunts in the camp quite a bit. In other words, they increased the supply of meat to the whole camp because they had no other dependents except each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the fact that you have the occasional gay couple in a hunter-gatherer camp is such a benefit to um, the meat supply and and you know the sort of level of uh, security within the whole camp that you know as far as I can tell I mean I think this was actually selected for you know <laughs> if you know what I mean you know I don't I don't think it was it was certainly not seen as something negative now two spirit I'm not sure about. Um, I do know that the one of the healers, one of the healers, uh, <laughs> I always thought he was really a woman, 
you know. Uh, but it, you know, was it was was accepted as a man and everything else. Of course, there would be no question of you know medical intervention or operations or hormone therapy or anything. It was just somebody who genuinely was to my mind, neither male nor female, but tended to adopt a male role. And that was because that person was a healer, okay? In other, you know, in other contexts, and I only met this person twice uh, in the whole time I was in the field because they didn't live with the group, that the, the um, um, local um, a band uh, uh, conglomeration or that, I, that I was spending most of my time in they were actually not hunting they were gathering with the women okay mm -hmm. so i'm kind of assuming that this was this this person had grown up as a female treated as a female child and ad identified that way to a point but then as they became really really interested in healing um it was part of an identity that was generally considered male or something I just don't know what to put of it but certainly that person was not uh, subject to any pre prejudice that I you know that I could see great does that answer your question yes it does thank you and I had so many more too because you know I live in northern California and you you, you didn't talk on the fire thing <laughs> oh yeah no I know well, I was trying to s sort of subdue myself and not talk about too many different subjects. <laughs> yeah. So, and Denise, and Denise to yeah. question to yeah. Helga, I was really fascinated by your remarks about the the feliners, like the the hunter par excellence, um, uh -huh. and the way that people, the hunters themselves, treated felines. What other kind of things did they do in their relationship with? Felines. And when they had a kill, did they leave an offering of a part of the kill to the feline? Oh, well, if it was a lion kill, I only saw this once, but at a lion kill, um, they chased the lions away, right? And then they took a haunch and then they left the rest for the lions. Because, uh, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't fair to take the whole thing. You know, but it was the haunch was just too tempting. I guess <laughs> they came home and everybody got a piece of it. It was a lot of meat on it. It was um, I can't remember if it was a hartebeest or a wildebeest, but you know, the, the, they. But the other thing is, I don't know if you ever saw this, but there was um. There were there were conferences. Uh, this one was held in Panama, um, of elders from various um, tribal and band level societies. And one of the elders came from a, a part of the Kalahari. And he recounts this thing about just before leaving, um, just before leaving for the conference, he was he came out of his hut and he was kind of walking around. And he walked around a bush and there was a lioness sitting there. And he said, you know, um, I looked at her, she looked at me. I, I, uh, you know, uh, not a, he, he did, he made some gesture of respect and then he just walked quietly on. And then he talks about how the, his people do not see the lions as um, dangerous or uh, bad. They see them as kinsmen. I can send you, I can send you that, um, that report if you like. Okay. But that's definitely what I found. Like I, I know that the Kwa told me after seeing this uh, body compound, they told me that they were horrified by what they saw. And what was in the pictures? It was a picture of a lion's head that had been cooked, being um, eaten by uh, a Bakalahari man. And his, because he had a couple of other people around him and he was sharing with them. And they just said this was completely unconscionable, you know. But of course, the Bakalahari have cattle and sometimes lions do attack people. And so I assume this animal was shot by one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the men in the group. And uh, they decided to eat it rather than just lie, let it lie there waste. I don't know what the details were. 
but I know that the, the, the reaction that I got when I showed people this picture was one of real disgust. I don't know if that helps, but <laughs> anyway, you know, most, most of the time leopards, oh, my, the leopard at my camp. I had a leopard that when, when I, I had a little camp next to Goatley's camp, right? And for a couple of nights in a row, um, I heard this sound, right? And I realized it was a leopard walking around the camp. It was curious, right? And, and, um, and I did a very foolish thing, I guess. I, I, I walked on the inside and I, and I went back at it. I was kind of playing with it. I, I don't know what I was thinking, but, but um, it worked, you know, and the leopard eventually left and, and everybody, everybody was very, very amused by this. You know, the leopard was not seen as a danger to either uh, myself or the other group. Now, perhaps if I had been more frightened or if I'd been, you know, made hysterical by it or tried to shoot it or something, the leopard would have thought again about how to interact with humans. I don't know. But I will tell you one thing. There was a, there was a big um, uh, cobra uh, near the camp where I originally was staying, right? And when I was setting up my camp, one of the women came over and she said she was going to introduce me. Okay. And she walked over and we walked around for a while and she was looking and looking. And then we finally saw the cobra and it was just relaxing. You know, it was just lying uh, uh, you know, under the branches of a, of a, of a tree. And she said, no, well, you just have to watch this. You don't want to step on this. Okay. And I said, my God, you <laughs> know, okay. So, you know, about the snake, thank you for telling me why, um, why camp near it? She said, oh no, it's very helpful because it cuts down on all the vermin. In other words, mice and other little things that come and, and gnaw the, you know, come around the camp and it, it deters those I had no idea you know <laughs> so if that helps at all the other thing come to think of it that um, that strikes me about the way hunter-gatherer literature is often viewed is that um, people you see you see these statements all the time that you know people couldn't afford to settle down they couldn't um, they couldn't stay in one place because the food wasn't enough and all this kind of stuff that's not what I was told at all. Nobody left because there was no food, ever. Not if it was a you know intact ecosystem that they were in. They left because they had to go to a party or somebody's christening or they had to, they had to go visit a friend or they promised somebody else to camp with them. They had social engagements, okay? They, 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 it wasn't hunger, okay? And, the, and it wasn't even that the local food supply was gone. Right. There was plenty. I mean, I, I was always I was sometimes surprised when people would suddenly decamp, you know, and because then I'd have to pack up and go along. Right. But but here's the thing. One of the reasons they gave now, this is kind of creepy. But anyway, here we go. One of the main reasons they gave and also one of the reasons why they really, really did not like settlements, the Kalahari settlements and the settled borehole areas uh, was because of tick fleas mites and other vermin that built up there right. okay and i can speak from personal experience because when i was first in the field a very kind bakalahari headman when i was you know interviewing because i did all these interviews with the bakalahari as well uh, offered me a hut for the night okay and unwisely i said oh how nice how kind and and at that point it was early on in my field work and sg um, my uh, guide interpreter, he opted to sleep in the truck, right? And he said, oh, well, you, go, you know, we'd always trade off. I slept not at all because I was so covered in flea bites and mites and I don't know what else was biting me all night <laughs> that I would never, ever do that again, you know? And I think you know, one of the things that you have to remember is that we settled humans, you know, with our civilization and everything else, long history of towns and settled houses and permanent fixtures and all the rest of it I, I think we tend to elevate that to a status where we assume that human beings have always wanted to live like this okay and I frankly doubt that I think uh, if you have a choice you just go camping 
and you move <laughs> frequently and you visit people all over the landscape and you have your whole garden around you and you just you know you don't got to worry about food or anything like that you 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 spend your whole life camping it's <laughs> fabulous what do we do when we're on vacation we go camping a lot of us anyway you know and if, if we don't go camping then we we go visit friends and relatives we fly all over the world to keep up our contacts and we go to conferences right well they get to do that without you know the airplanes and the, uh, all the rest of it but they also don't have the housework <laughs> trust me i have six huge dogs now wolfhound crosses uh, the housework <laughs> the dust at first I've sometimes said, oh, if only I was a hunter-gatherer, you know, I could just move away with dogs and um, and I wouldn't have to use the vacuum cleaner and the broom so much, you know? And you think it's a lot of work to be a sedentary person. Yep. It's a yep. lot of work, a lot more work to be a farmer. Huge amount of work, you know? And that... Jerome, do you want to come in? Do you... What's that? Chris, you've... Oh, sorry, sorry. There was just a couple more questions. Um, Jerome uh, and, right. and Chris both uh, coming in. But Jerome, do you want to go? And then Chris, and then anybody else? In right. The <laughs> okay, well, my question really is to return to the first thing that you talked about, which is this burial of a young girl with her hunting equipment in, uh, yeah. in South America. Now, the, the, critis the criticism that people like me level against those kinds of extrapolations is that you have one single case and then you suddenly extrapolate to a whole sort of hypothesis mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, women being these big game hunters or whatever it is that those <laughs> archaeologists are saying. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the same hand, to, on the same, uh, in the same way, they criticised people like me for elaborating from the basis of extant living hunter-gatherers and their life ways uh, mm -hmm. to critique uh, their assumptions about the past. And mm -hmm. I just wondered how you deal with that uh, situation in the sense that you have just offered us a very uh, vivid account of how some Sam people engage and live with their environment um, mm -hmm. as a sort of counter to the assumption that women would have been hunters in the past so i just wondered what, what in in terms of the theory behind what you're saying how can you justify uh critiquing their assumptions through the examples given by mm -hmm. living people okay well i didn't emphasize it uh perhaps enough that my critique of that um series of speculations that resulted from the the finding of that girl <coughs> that that critique arises from economic analysis. <clears throat> Hunting and gathering is an economy. It's an economic system. In other words, it's a particular, <clears throat> pardon me, it's a particular system of interacting with a local ecosystem. And it involves uh, the learning of particular skills, certain practices that um, lead to a sustainable interaction with that ecosystem. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know what I've got. I must have got a frog in my throat. And <coughs> the the analysis of it as an e as an economy means that <coughs> worldwide, if we look at every single hunting and gathering ethnography that's been done. There are certain consistent elements, okay? And <clears throat> the fire ecology, the ecological e engineering is one of those consistent elements that's becoming more obvious all the time. Um, <clears throat> the uh, organization, the social organization, that tends to occur 
in in particular the uh, bilateral kinship system network internal logic of the society that falls from that kind of an economy. And I don't think in spite of, you know, all the, the stuff that's been, uh, in, in spite of all of the uh, objections to this sort of more consistent picture of what makes a hunter-gatherer economy work, um, I think that stood the test of time. I mean, how long have we been studying hunter-gatherers? And, and the, the the essential aspects of it, the fact that it is not associated with starvation, generally, it's not associated with um, a lot of uh, agonistic behavior, because diplomacy and visiting and exchange of information is a far better survival strategy in an economy like that than, uh, than agonistic in encounters, certainly between bands, you don't see anything like that happening between bands. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they, these these kind of consistencies, I think, are important. And the the fact is that I can see two major areas where people is trying to create um, uh, another narrative. This one about the de labor, which is the one we talk about, right? The other one is the, the uh, political egalitarian, in, you know, very widely. That they, there's nobody who's going to go hungry if they're in, in a hunter camp, uh, in a hunter-gatherer society. It's being attacked right now. What is going on with this recording business? Uh. That's really weird. Great. Chris, oh, well. can you hear? Chris? <clears throat> yes, it's, 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 it's simply the fact that my Wi-Fi conked out and we, we didn't get an extra person to do the recording, so I'm afraid those bits have gone. Oh. It's annoying. So okay, when it so comes, maybe just switch it off. So when I come... Just switch it off. It's just... I don't want to switch the recording off because we're going to meet Miss Helga. I'm going to leave it on. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, please carry on, Helga. Um, I actually, after my experience in the call, I went, you know, went home and wrote my thesis up and everything else. But I was hunted um, by uh, the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics. And I, so I decided to take that job because they wanted to send me to West Africa. And they wanted to send me to West Africa where I would be staying in, a, in Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger, mostly in Burkina Faso and, and studying in detail the economy of past people, they were mostly horticulturalists, the farming people, and the pastoralists were classic, you know, mobile pastoralists, the Fulani, uh, at least traditionally. And what I wanted to understand was two things. One is, did ecological engineering <clears throat> continue? Was it consistent with these other economies? Okay, was I going to be able to find evidence of, you know, uh, some kind of understanding of fire ecology, or understanding of creating ecological mosaics. Uh, was the, the pastoral system creating uh, ecological hotspots, which is one of my, my interests. And the, with pastoralists, I didn't get to do that much research, but I was gratified to see some, uh, sometime about a year and a half or two years ago, a young woman out of uh, Washington University um, reported on the fact that um, 
in the in the Serengeti, where pastoralists had uh, been, you know, creating temporary camps for thousands of years, that they they were creating ecological hotspots because of the manure, concentrated manure of the animals, but probably also for the thing same things that I was describing among the hunter gatherers. In other words, you bring a lot of food there, spitting out seeds and all the rest of it, right? I mean, think about what humans do. We're a provisioning primate. We have a base camp, even if the base camp is New York City, right? And what we do is we concentrate um, uh, resources in these places and provision our, our dependents, okay? As a result, we produce, um, particularly in, the, in these other economies, um, proliferations of, um, you know, wild, wild and now domestic uh, plant varieties, animal varieties that were that the ones we use the most. So we've actually been, I think, in the even in tribal economies, we've been able to um, produce sustainable uh, systems of, of economic uh, behavior interacting with ecosystems in a positive way that creates long-term sustainability and also preserves the diversity of the wild resources, you know, the wild animal and plant resources. And so I would extend, I would extend that, uh, that understanding uh, to all what we call indigenous people worldwide, not just hunter gatherers. Um, their systems of e economic action within those ecosystems are not universally destructive. You know, in fact, they're the opposite. And if, if we don't, as anthropologists, if we don't get that message across um, soon, I, I don't know what's gonna happen to us as a species. Yeah. Don't worry, uh, Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Um, two more questions. Uh, William and Chris, do you, Chris, do you wanna say something? And then maybe we're wrapping up. Um, yes, um, so um, I'm, I'm just so glad that I kind of came in from the side and, and asked you about God's testicles. And I've got another question, which also is kind of coming from <laughs> um, uh, it, So it's, it's about your, your experience of how time is measured and how future occasions are sort of, you know, specified. So I'm thinking about the sun and the moon, of course. But in particular, we, when you were talking about the lions, I, I'm sure you're aware of the extraordinary, marvelous descriptions by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas of the what she calls the shift system between the lions uh, mm -hmm. and the humans, where the lions have the night and the humans have the day. Mm -hmm. And of course, it then makes a very big difference whether the night is a full moon or the night mm -hmm. is a dark moon. Um, and I just, I, I mean, just, I'm just hoping you you will <laughs> add to my fascination with those top those questions <laughs> oh any no. ideas any any yeah, night and day mm -hmm. well the thing is nighttime uh, this is a bit of a uh, divert digression from what you were saying but one of the things that i did learn right towards the end of my field work was how incredibly detailed the memorization of uh, nighttime constellations was. All right. How much attention was paid to kind of predicting, you know, um, like everybody of course knows night, day, seasonal changes, everything is predictable and so on. They were interested in predicting, you know, eclipses just like everybody else. But what really got me was the fact that I had paid no attention to um, night sky as a really important navigational tool, you know, constellations and so on. And what got me to understand this was just before I left, a number of the people, mostly kids, <laughs> gave me ostrich eggs, okay? And these are decorated. I don't know if they're decorated in other parts of the Kalahari. I understood that they're, they probably aren't, but they had always decorated their eggs. And it was mostly kids doing etchings, okay? And so I, I, I saw this one egg 
and I wish I could hold it out for you, but I, I donated them all to the University uh, Archaeology Lab here at the University of Alberta. But um, there was a, what looked like a snake on the egg. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, oh, you know, is this, you know, and I asked if it was that cobra <laughs> kind of thing. And the little kitten said, looked at me and he said, no, it has nothing to do with earthly things. You know, it has nothing to do with, with the common things. And, and at night, and then he pointed at the constellation Hydra. Wow. That's what it was. Wow. And a lot of these designs that they were putting on these eggs were constellations. Some of them were representations of animals, you know, but they were constellations. They were, they were using stories about, you know, um, various events in a kind of mythological sense to help the kids remember these constellations. And they were practicing them all the time. Usually by drawing in the sand. But I sometimes you're thinking in terms of a numerical sense or an awareness of recording time and changes in time, being aware of the night sky, being aware of the movement of constellations, being aware of um, you know being able to predict these things. That that is definitely highly developed. And it's uh, so far pretty much overlooked in a way. Yeah. And it kind of bothers me that, you know, we've had so many other things take precedence when we study hunter gatherers, yeah. just their very survival now is in question. And, um, and we haven't, we haven't even, as far as I'm concerned, scratched the surface of their science. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, Wait, William, have you got one last question? And then maybe we're wrapping up. Yeah, it's, it's a quick observation more than a question, but I would like, a, if, like to see if, she, if Helga has an answer. Um, I have heard that God's Ball stories before. I read it somewhere. And I can't remember, the most likely place I read it was there's a big collection that was done in the late 1800s, I think it was, of mm -hmm. South African stories among the Bushmen. I Which story had you heard before? I'm sorry. God's Balls. Oh, really? Well, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's very widespread. <laughs> they didn't invent it for my, for my benefit. The, the more interesting um, thing is what the, my first um, inclination was that I read it in, in uh, The Raw and the Cook, Levi Strauss. Mm -hmm. Oh, that'd be interesting. Which would mean it's all the way over here, which means it's one of those really old stories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, there are a lot. I've, I've, uh, I should talk to Megan Beasley more about this because my collection of mythology was very limited. Uh, it wasn't what I was focused on, but I have a couple of other stories. Uh, one in particular, which um, I call the, uh, uh, I don't know what it called, um, the. Um, the poisonous farts. <laughs> the story, the story of the poisonous farts, which is um, uh, a story about God coming, coming to Earth to uh, rectify a problem. Oh, the first part of the story is called the 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 Buffalo Wife and the poisonous farts. Okay, which is even more confusing for you, I'm sure, but. Be Megan has a very similar story from, you know, a thousand miles away, wh yeah. where instead of um, uh, a buffalo wife, it's an elephant wife. And I suspect uh, that this story of a, of a human who mates with an animal, marries, falls in love with an animal, and then has to be pulled back from that error. is very, very widespread. You know, the mermaid story comes from this, I think the story in Scotland about selkies, you know, the, the sea lions that, that uh, come into human society is a beautiful, you know, beautiful young woman. And, and many, many other stories that sort of indicate that, that the tie between humans and animals 
is very, very intimate, intimate enough that we can, in a sense, almost see kinship with them, intermarrying with them, and that it's only because of God's interrupt, uh, you know, the deity's rules and interruptions that we pulled back, you know, and children are children are pulled back. There's a there's a term for it in a sense. Um, I think it's biophilia, the love of life, the love of living things. And this is so critical to the way that humanity functions. I mean, why do we have house plants? <laughs> By the way, that's a mini rex. Anyway. I, I just heard about your, your rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I just heard from Jerome about you've got rabbits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, we we respond, every little child responds at first with wonder and joy, even at the sight of, you know, like ants, <laughs> you know, little, little critters, but we just adore living things, especially baby things, right? And, and, and most of the people I know um don't even think about this why do we have gardens why do we bring flowers i mean really the genitals of plants when we go to a funeral i mean just think about it but it's bi biophilia it's like these are the, the the most extraordinary and representative tokens that nature provides us okay so the the love of the natural world i think is something that um it, it, we have to be taught to differentiate ourselves, but also to be, you know, respectful to it. And, and I see this in a lot of mythology, you know. Anyway, I'm talking too much. But maybe you could have me back another time for anything we've missed today. <laughs> I, think we, I think we will. Yeah, it, it's been a fantastic talk. And... Um, you covered so many things and got so many people enthralled and without PowerPoint is absolutely wonderful to just hear people yeah, talking. Yeah, no, that's fun. Also yeah. so nice. Okay. Uh, so wow. yeah, we're definitely, definitely, everyone's uh, very, very thankful for it. Um, mm. We'll definitely want to come, we want you to come back and hear some more about it all. So thank you so much, Helga. Okay, you're welcome. Um, it's been it a fun. fascinating sure. insight. So many things come up uh, uh, that, that we could follow up. Oh, I meant to ask, yeah. there's this um, thing about chat at the bottom of the page. I haven't even uh, gone there to, to look. Uh, at yeah, it's I chatting. I there, could, most, I, yeah, there's a few questions. I could send it to you um, if you like. I could send mm. it to you. I could yeah, send it to no, you. I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing what people chat. <laughs> Maybe I'm yeah. too sure. Anyway, I have to go and feed my horses now. So, I yeah. To... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Me too. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you.